Oh, we can start with the advert. Today's episode of the Inside EVs podcast is brought to you by E-Range EV Tire. E-Range EV Tires are specifically engineered for electric vehicles. Using an advanced manufacturing process called liquid phase mixing, E-Range EV's EcoPoint 3 technology creates a tire with lower rolling resistance and longer range, while offering low levels of wear and high grip. All this while staying affordable. Go to erangetires.com. That's E-R-A-N-G-E, tires.com, to find your EV's next set of tires. Welcome to the first ever Inside EVs podcast. Today, we'll be talking about the production delay of the Rivian R1T all-electric pickup truck, the Tesla Model Y teardown video series by Monroe and Associates, the Tesla Model S performance increase with its new Cheetah Stance launch mode, and much, much more. Thanks for joining us. Hello and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast, the weekly podcast from Inside EVs. I'm Dominic Chioni. I'm uh, Inside EVs editor and Inside EVs forum moderator. Uh, This is episode number one. Uh, Today we have with us Tom Malogny. He is a longtime EV advocate and an Inside EVs editor. Uh, We also have Martin Lee from the EV Daily News podcast and Kyle Connor from Out of Spec Motoring, a YouTube channel and a contributor now to Inside EVs EVs as well. Um, So, gentlemen, how are you all doing? Good. Doing fine. Yeah, everything's good. All right. Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for April the 7th, 2023. This is episode 157 in the third anniversary of the show. Thanks for joining us today and for the 156 weeks prior. We really appreciate it. So on today's show, we'll be talking about driving the Hyundai Ioniq 6, the Nissan Ariya, and the 2023 Toyota Prius and the uh, newly re- revealed tech specs of the Ram REV, or REV. And of course, much, much more. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EV's editor, former moderator, and host of the YouTube channel Drive Electric with Dominic. Joining us today is the indefatigable Mr. Tom Logdi, senior editor at Inside EV's and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge. We, ha- we also have the mastermind, Mr. Martin Lee, from the EV News Daily podcast, which is available on all the best podcast platforms. And of course... Kyle Connor joins us from the majestic, practically palatial halls of Out of Spec Studios, where he produces high voltage videos for a number of YouTube channels. Welcome, everybody. Great things. Good morning. Good morning. Hey guys. Happy anniversary, I guess. Right? The anniversary. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I tell you, it's been it's been a pleasure the last three years working with you guys. This has been a lot of fun, hasn't it been? Oh yeah. my goodness. Dominic, what the heck happened to your hair? I know, right? <laughs> I didn't know like, hair could grow that fast. I was like, all respectable looking one moment, and then boom, like it's all over my face. It's, all, it's like out of control. All right. So I guess uh, let's, uh, I don't know, we we'll just jump right into this, right? We got a bunch yeah. of stuff to talk about today. It's been a busy week. Um, so let's kick this off with what we've been driving. Uh, so, Tom, last week we talked uh, about your interview with Ford CEO Jim Farley. But I just want to remind people that it's now up on, on your channel, State of Charge, and we have a post supporting that on Inside EVs. And you can find that just by typing Jim in the search on the site, or, or Farley will work too. I tried them last night. They both <laughs> work. Um, but uh, okay, it's time to get her- heretical. Heretical? Yes. Uh, okay. But don't please don't burn us at the stake. So we don't often talk about plug-in hybrids on the show, but this week, Tom, you posted your first drive review of the new Toyota, Toyota Prius. So the Prius has been a Toyota model since like 1997. And they, they finally made one that looks genu- genuinely attractive. Uh, it's much more powerful and has like a much improved all electric range, like 39 to 44 miles, depending on the trim level. Uh, it's got enough range that you actually did a 70 mile an hour range test with it and got a pretty fantastic result despite like bad weather. So Tell us about the latest Prius and what it's like to drive and why we should talk about a hybrid on, on the Inside EVs podcast. <laughs> All right. So to be clear, what I drove was the Prius Prime. 
Uh, not the regular Prius because okay. they, they had the first drive event for the Prius a few months ago. And, you know, I declined to, to, to go to that one. I'll only do the drives on vehicles that actually plug in. And I, we typically don't even do too many plug-in hybrid, uh, like first drive reviews, at least. I think the, the team over at Motor One usually handles those. We yeah. punt it over to them. Uh, but um, this was a unique vehicle. and I thought it was uh, important enough for us to... Uh, to, to do a first drive and uh, check it out because, you know, the Prius has been immensely popular throughout the years. And of recent years, it, it the popularity has waned. There's a lot of reasons for that. The hybridization of Toyota's full line of vehicles has, has taken some of the luster off the Prius's brand. The Prius was the hybrid. It was the vehicle that had the best fuel economy and all this for many years. And Toyota sold millions of them. But the sales have dwindled and it's, it's, yeah. they really don't sell a lot of, a, a lot of Prius anymore. Uh, so for this next generation, Toyota kind of scrapped the game plan for the Prius and they, they totally made it a completely different vehicle. It used to be, you know, f uh, you know, f form following function where it was, it had to have a lot of cargo. It had to be efficient and well, however it came out looking, well, that was just, you know, a, a byproduct of, of making the vehicle do what we wanted it to do. But if you look at this last generation now, it's the opposite. It's kind of like we want it to look good and hopefully it'll have enough cargo space and enough headroom and, and be efficient enough, you know, to be a Prius. So it, it, it's an interesting vehicle uh, to put in perspective. I mean, you could see the looks, obviously. I think anybody would say it's the best looking Prius we've ever had. I don't think that could even be argued, you know, and, and looks are subjective, but it looks great. I, you know, being walking up to it, walking around it, I'm like, I would drive this and not want to wear a face mask and glasses, you know, like how I would feel with previous Prius. Like, you know, I don't want, I don't want anybody to see me in that, but um, I think it looks awesome. And, uh, but driving wise, power wise. Okay. The previous Prius prime had 121 horsepower. This, this vehicle has 220 horsepower. That's 82% more power. When do you ever get a vehicle that the next generation has 80% more power than the previous generation? You know, like 25% is enormous, you know? So, it, and that, that just tells you the priorities are in a completely different position for this vehicle. They, they, they Toyota emphasized driving experience over, you know, the, the, the basic, the things that made the Prius a Prius, you know, being super efficient, you know. So, I mean, the, the steering felt better. The suspension felt better. It felt like a, a it was a fun car to drive, which I could never say that before about a Prius. And I know I, I seem to be knocking previous generation Priuses here. The Prius was a wonderful car for what it was designed to do. It was the best at it for a long time. Economical transportation that offered utility and, you know, that was, you know, relatively affordable. And, um, you know, that's why they sold so many of them. But uh, Toyota's taking a completely different approach now. And the, the Prius Prime uh, is well-balanced. It, it drives well. It's more of like third, gener third generation Volt than it is a, 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 a Prius, in my opinion. You know, where the Volt went for sporty and, uh, you know, performance and also having great economy. So I, I, I think they, they did a good job with it. It's unfortunate they didn't make an all electric version. You know, I know um, that would have been fantastic if they came out with the, the hybrid, the plug in hybrid and the all electric version, like, like many of the other um, automakers do. I think that would have been a, a good option, but Hey, we, we all know we've, we've beat to death here on, on this podcast, how our feelings of how Toyota's positioning himself with regards to fully electric vehicles, that's going to change evidently, but it didn't change for this this generation of uh, of, of Prius. So what we talk about, uh, I was able to do a, a, a range test. I didn't think I was going to be able to when I first got out there because very small loops that we we're supposed to drive in. And I didn't know where the highways were going to be. But as, as it turns out, where we were staying in Carlsbad, I was like one mile from I-5. So nice. and again, I, I didn't know if the traffic was going to be bad. So often in California, you can't maintain 70 miles an hour on, on, on the highways because the traffic is so, is so tough. So once I got out onto the highway, I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to try to do this. And I just kept driving and only for one short period for like two or three miles did I have to knock it down to like 62, 63 miles an hour. 
and and that for such a short period of time that barely is going to affect the, the the results of the uh, of of the test. And I was able to go 34 miles before the uh, the the gasoline engine kicked in. Now the the this new generation Prius, in addition to being more powerful, it's got a bigger battery, 13.6 kilowatt hour battery. The outgoing Prius Prime had an 8.8 .8 kilowatt hour battery pack, so much bigger battery. And its EPA rated range is 44 miles when you get the SE. That's the entry level trim. It's a little bit lighter and it has 17 inch wheels. So it has a 44 mile EPA range rating. The, the XSE and XSE premium, which I was driving, is a little heavier and it has 19 inch uh, uh, sport wheels. So that knocks the uh, range down a little bit to 39 miles. So the vehicle I was driving has an EPA combined range rating of 39 miles per charge. I was able to get 34 miles at a constant 70 miles an hour in a driving rain uh, on a highway that didn't have uh, consistent elevation. You know, there was definitely an elevation channel. I didn't map it out, but it wasn't as flat as as um, as as I usually do them. There was at least a couple hundred miles of elevation change while I was uh, driving. So in my opinion, that's a win. I'm certain if I had this vehicle here at home uh, and I was driving around town and, and running errands and so forth, I could get 50 miles of uh, all electric range before the uh, the gasoline engine turned on. Yeah, I would bet. Yeah, 50 miles sounds very, very attainable going by, you know, what you were saying in your first drive video. Mm -hmm. right on. And Don is asking, what's the total estimated range with a full battery and tank? I think it. I think it was 550 for the uh, the X uh, XSE and XSE Premium and 600 for the SE. Although it might have been 600 and 650, but somewhere in that in that ballpark. Um, so very 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 long range when you combine the uh, you know the the all electric with the uh, with the gas tank. Right. Um, I think it's like 52 miles per gallon average um, running in hybrid mode. Right on. It looks a lot, lot better on the interior too. That's the way. I, yeah. I didn't ever like that, like a huge center thing down the middle of the spine of the the old Prius. Had, yeah. You know, yeah. I am and, so and into this thing, Tom. It looks awesome. It looks like it rips. The last gen Prius Prime. I actually re did a track review against the Ferrari. Uh, I'm trying to remember, was it a was it a pista? I can't remember what, exactly what it was. Oh no, I chose the luxury for. I did like the Portofino, which is the cruiser. So I did a Prius Prime against the Portofino. The Prius Prime won because it had more USB ports and cup holders, of course. Um, <laughs> it's just like awesome uh, to see Toyota go here. The, the one thing I think has to be said, and look, I see arguments on either side, was this should have been fully electric, or at least they should have had a fully electric. Prius option. Why are they still stuck in the past with, um, you know, BZ4X and this isn't battery electric? Did you talk to them about that at all? I did, and um, you know that you you'll get mixed answers from different Toyota representatives. Uh, you know, and uh, you know at the the after the drive, you know, you get to sit down, talk to engineers, and you get to talk to some of the program managers. And you know, there were quite a few people, and they knew it was coming with me. They do their homework. They know who the people are at these um, events. And what their positions are. So, you know, I um, definitely, uh, you know, they knew they knew that I was going to come at them with this question. And, you know, some of the people said, you know, quite honestly, you know, I think I think that would have been something that we should have considered. But but we didn't. Uh, and then I followed it up with, hey, you know, the disappointing thing to me. And we had a long discussion with this at dinner, actually, for hours with with two of their Toyota reps was that I said, look, you know, Toyota has been such a leader with. Um, technology and uh, and hybrids for so long. It's such a shame that you're not you're falling behind in electrification. And you know some of them look at you and say, "Well, you know, we're not falling behind. We have so many miles and everything." I say, "But the point of the matter is, even just for perception, mm -hmm. you know, with with you you came out with one electric vehicle, the the BZ4X, and let's face it, it's not that good." And, and, you know, they looked at me and nobody disagreed with me at the table. I said, right, if you right. want to judge it against its peers as an electric vehicle, it's not a good electric vehicle. There's nothing about it that is, is cutting edge, is industry leading. It's actually, you know, behind the times. I said, in your Toyota, for crying out loud, how come you don't have one EV, even if you know you're not going to sell a lot of them, even if it's a halo car that you could that you put out there and say, look, this is what we could do. 
we know batteries and um, look at what we can do with batteries. But, you know, and nobody disagreed with me that, you know, they, they, they think that maybe that that wouldn't have been a bad philosophy. But, hey, it's not what what the leadership, uh, you know, over in Japan, uh, the leadership has taken that position. But it's supposed to change now. They're saying the next couple of years we're going to have how many fully electric uh, Toyotas coming out. And, um, you know, let's let's see. But it is unfortunate because Toyota was a leader for so long with, with, with battery tech and hybrid and hybrids. And it just seems like they're an also ran now with, with regards to, you know, electric vehicles. Right. And there's so many startups today too. You know, there's a lot of people just like, well, they want that market share that Toyota has had traditionally. And, uh, you know, they're not, Toyota's going to have to struggle, I think, to, to get, I don't know, maybe they won't. I don't know. They have such a great name, right? Reputation. I don't know if they're going to struggle, Dom. I, I still believe, and maybe I'm just, you know, not being realistic here. I still believe that the minute they put their minds to making an outstanding electric car, we'll get an outstanding all-electric Toyota. You know, a lot of people say, oh, you can't just flip the switch and, you know, and 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 do that. And maybe they're right. This is just my opinion. I do believe, because I know Toyota has more battery experience than even Tesla. They probably have more you know, they've put out that more high voltage traction batteries in electric vehicles than anybody because they've been doing it for 25 years. They have fantastic engineers. Some of their, their, uh, you know, hybrid systems and, and even the fuel cell systems. I know we don't, um, we're not going down the fuel cell way, but other manufacturers have paid to license Toyota technology in, in hybrids and fuel cells because their engineers are so good at alternative powertrains. So I'm certain they could make a kick-ass fully electric car if they wanted to. They simply didn't want to with the BZ4X. Right. Yeah. It should be interesting. I, I did see that they're, they're going to do some reorganization around their EV strategy now with the, with the new president. Mm-hmm. So I, we'll have to see how that pans out. But yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, with the Prius, going back to the Prius Prime, there's still a lot of people that don't want an electric car. Sure. You know that that and 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 this is going to appeal to them. It be, and you know and and we talk about being an electric car and training wheels. You know, the people people will have this this Prius Prime. They'll learn the habits of plugging in, mm-hmm. and then then they'll say, you know, I want more. You know, we saw that with Volt owners early on in 2010. You know, oh, they the love their they love their Volt. But mm-hmm. but then their next car was a fully electric car because they got used to plugging in. They said this isn't too hard. This is pretty. It's pretty. It's actually better than getting gas. They did everything that they could to not fill up with the gas. And some Volt owners did such a great job at it, where even with the 30, 40 mile range, they never bought gas. They bought gas like once every six months. Well, if you could squeeze make a a 40 mile EV car, the gas tank lasts for six months. You could sure as heck live with a Bev. You know, so right. um, right. I think we're going to see that with the with the with the plug in hy- hybrid Prius. In my opinion, look, I'm not a plug in hybrid guy, uh, but I understand there's there's a room for it in the market. And I think this new generation Prius Prime kicks ass. I think it's a it, it's a great driving experience. It looks great. It feels great sitting in the seat. It, you can you, you're going to get 40 to 50 miles of all electric range. You know, you're, you're going to average well over 100 miles per gallon with, with, with this vehicle if you plug it in, uh, you know, whenever you have the opportunity to. And uh, one of the negatives I'll say is it only has a 16 amp onboard charger, it can only charge at 3.5 kilowatt. Um, you know, Even that's fine if you're going to. What's that? Even on the top spec model? Yeah. Yeah. That's so, different than RAV4 Prime, which lets you go on the top spec to 6.6. Yeah. You know, um, unless I miss something in the specs. I, I forgot to ask them that because I was I read the spec sheet and it just says you know four hours on uh, on on level two, 11 hours on level one, no option for 6.6 kilowatt onboard charger. Um, so that's disappointing that that um, you can't charge faster. Um, but let me go back and look at that. Geez, that would have been a big miss if I missed it. But hey, I've I've done it before. Um, uh, the only everything I saw just showed me that the 16 amp. And, uh, and the original press release said, you know, it takes four hours to recharge. It didn't say, and with the optional onboard yeah, charger. So I think it has a 16 app. It, 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 yeah. Whenever you would see it on that spreadsheet, they break it down by trim. It would just yeah. be on the right side that it has. Yeah, the, and it, it, it didn't It didn't say 30 amp or 32 amp. So, um, you know, that's what it is. And it, it, they're, they're figuring 
everybody is just going to come in and once a day plug in at night. Now, if you do that at night, it doesn't matter if you've got a 16 amp or if it had an 80 amp on board charger yeah. because it's going to recharge overnight. But there are people that would, like you and I, Kyle, if we had one, drive 10, 20 miles, come back to your house and, and plug it in. And then an hour or two later, we, we'd run out and do another 30 or 40 mile drive. And, you know, you'd, you you could drive 60 miles in a day with it with uh, on a, on battery. You can't do that with a 16 amp onboard charger. Yep. Um, yeah. Having a look at the uh, other reviewers that put theirs live two days ago, I presume that was when we were allowed to. Yes. Uh, Cars.com says... Uh, the Prius Prime's onboard charger maxes out at 3.5 kilowatts. So, yeah, yeah, other outlets are saying the same, which is yeah. uh, it, comp it compares it to the the Hyundai Tucson um, plug-in hybrid. It says, you know, sort of plug-in hybrids should do 7.2 kilowatts. So I guess the the RAV4 can do twice that. So Only if um, you spec the max model, though. Level. Oh. But, hey, really I mean, look, let, let, let's, let's look at it the other way. This could be a plug-in hybrid where uh they deem to put a ccs plug on like some german cars do that, that <laughs> yeah. drives me i'm glad they did not do that yeah that drives me mad well, well, when well, i see that i'm like no yeah. bmw what are you doing well the um the you know the the mitsubishi still has the uh the chatamo plug on the on the outlander uh plug-in hybrid the only thing i will say as far as the slower charging the prius prime actually when you compare it to the other um uh, plug-in hybrids it does have a very small battery Right. Now it's 13.8 kilowatt hour is the max is the full capacity. You only get about 11 kilowatt hour out of that because it reserves the bottom like uh, 10% or so for, for hybrid driving so that it always has a healthy amount of battery to, to blend high, the hybrid driving. You can't just drain it down to nothing. And then the, uh, the gasoline engine is doing all of the work. So you know, when you think of, when you put it that way, the most you can recuperate is 11 kilowatt hour. How big of an onboard charger do you need? You know, sure. the, the, the sure. you know, the, 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 the 16 amp onboard charger is probably going to refill it. They said about four hours, it's probably going to fill it in three and a half hours or so. So and it's you, still pretty quick, even with a, with, with, with a small onboard charger. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. I don't know. We need to talk about any more Prius. I'm done with Prius. Tom, you done with Prius? I mean, I, I like the idea of the, you know, plug-in hybrids and the, because like you were saying, you know, it's, that's, that's a car that some people just aren't ready for electric yet. And, you know, they feel comfortable getting into this and it means like more electric miles if they, you know, if they bought, it's a, a, you know, a straight hybrid or, you know, something that doesn't plug in, it's not, I don't know, the more electric miles, the better is the way that I look at it. So I, I think the same people think I'm going to hate it because it's Toyota, but it, the more choice that people have on the market the better because you'll make your own choice so adding plug-in hybrids as long as it doesn't stop any great pure electric cars being made and in toyota's case maybe it would be but it's not as if we're not going to get you know a model y because toyota came out with a plug-in hybrid right. then i think it adds to the market it wouldn't be for me but i think the more choice we have on our shelves it's like you know it's like it's like pre-grated cheese right people who buy that have really given up on life my wife <laughs> buys pre-grated cheese and um uh, and it's like it's not that onerous really to just a great cheese but she still buys it in the packet right so but i don't want to ban pre-grated cheese so i wouldn't want to stop people buying a plug-in hybrid even if i think if you buy one you've probably given up on life a little bit <laughs> <laughs> i'm joking they they're useful in they're useful in a way one last thing I want to note that I found interesting. Toyota put a lot of like work in the regenerative braking. And and the what I mean in that is there's so many different settings. You have the regular setting where if you just get in the car, it defaults to a regular regen. You can put the vehicle in B drive mode, which increases the regen. Then depending on which um drive uh mode you have it in normal, eco, or sport, the regenerative braking is adjusted. You get the most regen in sport. But then if you go into the driver's display and you go through like four different screens, scroll through different screens, there's um, a thing called deceleration modes. And there's three levels of deceleration. So there's like nine different levels of, of mm. that. I don't think anybody is going to go into the, the driver's display because, first of all, it was really hard to find. I had to have the Toyota rep show me how to get to it. And, um, and, and, and the weird thing about it is it doesn't stick. So you could set one of those three levels of regen 
And then as soon as you turn the car off, it 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 re it resets. So you know, I don't think I don't think many people are going to go and uh, and do that. But uh, I thought it was interesting that they have so many different ways to adjust the regenerative braking on it. Right. Great conversation about cheese going on here in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> a cheese leadist, if you will. <laughs> yes. I mean, look, I prefer a soft cheese anyway, and you can't even grate that. So if you give me something I can spread, I'm very happy. So that's right. the smellier and the spreadier, the better. But that's just my personal life choices. Right. We should move on. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, I'm just now thinking about cheese. We should, oh, okay. should probably All move right. on. It's been three years of chaos. All right, so Kyle, <laughs> three years of chaos. Um, Actually, before so Kyle, we get to me, I just want to commend Tom really quick on hosting panels at the New York Auto Show. It was pretty cool. Yes. He had representatives from like every major DC player, or at least a, a portion of them. And uh, yeah, I haven't watched the videos yet, but apparently they're all on YouTube, so we can watch okay. Tom moderate some stuff. Can what? you tell us a little bit about that, Tom? Because yeah. that was really yeah, Tom, neat. Tom, where, where, where can we find these? Yeah, it was, it was, uh, um, you can, they have on either the Facebook page or the YouTube channel of the New York Power Authority. I know that's one place. I think they're being hosted in other places too, but I, I know the New York Power Authority's Facebook page and, um, and their YouTube channel has, has the videos. It's about an, it's about an hour long. And I was asked to moderate a panel on DC fast charging, the state of DC fast charging. So we had, um, representatives from the New York Power Authority from Electrify America, from uh, the state of New York, from because it was hosted by New York Power Authority, uh, also from Chargeway, Matt Teske, Kyle knows um, it's, a, it's an app that kind of helps people understand charging and levels of power. Uh, and we were gonna, we were supposed to have a representative from General Motors attend, but she couldn't make it because there was really bad weather, a flight got canceled. Then she rebooked for the morning and that got delayed and she wouldn't have made it to make it to the show. So it was kind of, we were scrambling at the last minute and the New York power authority asked me, they're like, Tom, you probably know a lot of people here. Can you get somebody to come on? So I walked around and um, I saw the hotel booth. So, uh, and I know that they're getting more into DC fast charging. I know Kyle went and spoke to the folks at hotel um, a while ago and you did a video on it. And um, so I went over and I ran into John Thomas. Kyle, did you talk to John? Yeah, he's the COO of Autel Energy. And I told him, I said, look, you feel like sitting on a panel and talking about charging? And he was like, yeah, I'll do it. So uh, we got John to join in and uh, it was a good discussion. Yeah, this is a one-on-one -on -one discussion I had with John Markowitz, uh, who's the e-mobility manager for um, uh, the New York Power Authority. And he's kind of in charge of planning and implementing New York's Evolve uh, DC fast charging network, which interestingly, New York, you think California is a leader in DC fast charging and, 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 you know, just electrification. New York state has the largest like state installed and run DC fast charging network in the country. So really? they, they're not waiting for Electrify America and EVgo and other companies to do it. New York state said, we're going to light up the state with DC fast charging. Now, the only problem, I mean, and it works great. I've used the Evolve Network many times to get up to Canada and to get up to upstate New York. The only, if I'm going to knock it, is they use equipment from all different manufacturers and different networks. So there's not a consistent way to start your charge. Now, Kyle and I won't have a problem with that. But if, if you're just a new person getting an EV... And, and you want to drive through the state and, and you're going to use the Evolve network. You go to one charger and you this is how you turn you activate your charge. And now you go to the next one. It might be a different process, a different a different way to to, to, to get your charge. So it's just um, that's a little negative. But, hey, um, that's um, that, 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 that's, in my opinion, a minor thing compared to the fact that New York went out there and is putting in a comprehensive network to cover the state. And I really give them credit for that. So when they asked me to host this panel, I said, yeah, I, I appreciate what you guys have been doing there. Sure. I'll come and, um, and do this. And it was, a, it was, it was a good time. We had a good, we, we had a good discussion. If anybody wants to watch it, it's available on YouTube and on Facebook. All right. Cool. Cool. Now I got something to do this afternoon. I was right. So Kyle. And thanks for pointing that out, Kyle. All right. So, so Kyle, last week we, we talked a lot about the Hyundai Ioniq 6, but we didn't talk about how it is to drive because those, those impressions were still under embargo. So now the embargo has lifted 
inquiry inquiry minds want to know how it is to drive um and it's really and it's, you have a whole separate video about this it's the efficiency in commuting traffic like would you buy it over a tesla model 3 and i asked that because you also have another video tackling that topic so you got like three videos on the well, this will be this will be the fastest uh review ever because right, right. how does it drive just like an ionic 5 What's the exactly. efficiency? It's 3.7 miles per kilowatt hour in commuting high speed traffic. It was pretty good, but this was the least efficient one. And would I buy it over a Tesla Model 3? No. Oh, I wouldn't. Yeah, I didn't. That's the one close. How could you? You don't, I don't have know. a I good didn't watch that video. network. You have terrible app. You don't have good route planning. But like these are the things that matter to me. Some people just don't want to drive a Tesla, which I totally respect. Yeah. And then sure. this is a very good second second option, but you're going to have to go through poops as a non Tesla EV driver. Um, you know, if you just charge it home every day and then you know do a commute, then it would be fine. But then why are you buying a sixty thousand dollar car? This was fifty seven. If you're just doing right. that, just buy a cheap Leaf or a Fiat five hundred e for that purpose. Um, you know, you don't need a long range big electric car for you know the the commute. So it should be a car that can do everything. They were so close. Uh, but they just can't match what the Model 3 offers for value on money. And I went in depth on that. Um, you know, very good build quality, very good driving dynamics, unbelievably good driving dynamics. Thought the same thing about the Ionic 5, very right. similar here. Um, you know, everything is unbelievably refined from the hardware packaging and the way that the car looks and drives and feels. But uh, then you like you, you go into the software and they just like bah, drop the ball. It's like they just didn't, they just took the software from their ICE cars and put it in an EV. And that has proven for every automaker that does not work. Sorry, you can't do that. You have to have EV specific software in there. You have to build everything from the ground up. This is the first car that Hyundai has produced that supports over the air updates to every module. I don't even know if it's every module, but it's to most modules. And right. the crazy thing about that is, we have no idea because this is their first one. By the way, Tesla started doing this in 2012. This is the first one, and we don't know how frequently they're going to update the car. My guess is not very often. And so, it, right. it doesn't support plug-in charge on Electrify America, which is their partner charging network, which is ridiculous. And um, look, they got the engineering so right. It is right. no question that car is built better than a Tesla. It drives more comfortably than a Tesla. It's still very efficient. However, um, for me, I can't recommend it over a Tesla. And I made a whole video about that. And the only reason I would is if you just refuse to buy a Tesla. Right. So, and, and but it's mostly down to like the software and I guess the charging networks then? Well, it's, you have to look at a, a vehicle in, in the full sphere of what it's intended to do. If, you know, for example, I love my Twizy, right? But it only does a very subset of things. Right. And I also have a Tesla Model 3 that can do, it's not really perfect in any category, but it can do a large amount of different things really well. This can do a large amount of things really well, except for certain items where the user, a, a power user needs to come in and tune the drive settings properly and tune the regen settings to your likely liking and then tune the the route planning and get you know preconditioning put on which is menus deep and these things are fine if tom you martin or i drive the car we can optimize it i can get everything out of this car no problem and when you do it's really good but the car is not going to help you do that so i'm not necessarily against the ionic 6 um you know, I, I think it's still one of the best cars I've driven all year. They were just so close to surpassing Tesla and just couldn't get there. And the amount of reviews that I saw saying this is a Tesla killer just blows my mind um, right. because like it shows how many journalists don't spend time with Teslas. Um, right. Like just I mean, well, Tesla doesn't make that easily, but it, right. no, they really do. Because you go to Hertz and seventy six dollars a day, you can rent a Model 3. Right, but they're not, in the, they're not delivered to their, you know, you're doing like a lot of writers have, you know, cars every week delivered that's to That's ridiculous. It, it, that's unethical anyway. It, it should be, you if you're an automotive journalist, everyone needs to rent a Tesla every few months and cover the updates and cover all that stuff because this is the the, the most important car company right now, in my opinion. Yeah, and, in, the, in the EV space for sure, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and, I, and I, I've, I've said this before and I, I completely agree with, with Kyle. I don't own a Tesla personally. And so I just make sure that every so often, every maybe three months, I spend a good amount of time in one. Um, and particularly the software, it just it just gets better every time I use it. Um, 
And I think that's that's what's really impressive. But if you haven't driven one in a period of time and then you're giving your opinion on the electric vehicle space and you haven't driven a Tesla in a while, that then you are at fault. Then you do need to go and spend not just an hour, but have one and live with one and and just play with the software and delve delve into it. There's stuff that doesn't change. Like the ride still the ride still sucks. And the last Model Y I drove didn't have a parcel shelf, which just tickled me pink because like i just spent sixty thousand dollars can you put some cardboard in the back please um <laughs> but i gather that the new ones come with one right so um but again so again i need to, i want to drive a model y out of germany which i've not done yet and that i'm at fault for wanting to come on and you know spout opinions about tesla i've not driven one out of that factory so people have got to do that i really i quite strongly believe actually people if you're going to have an opinion on tesla you need to have driven one recently because at least once a year and like don't put your whole career on the line saying you can't drive a tesla because they don't bring one to your house for a hundred dollars right. it hurts like right. just go rent one once a year for a hundred dollars a year and that right. way you can stay up to date and you can see what they're doing and do comparison tests and run the car side by side and take them on trips and charge them at home and see how they operate and get the app connected and everything i mean it's so great to use a tesla in daily driving and just driving more electric cars shows me that hey you know the problems that we had in 2019 when more ccs evs started to come out are the same exact problems we're having today i'm seeing no improvement in ownership of these cars and uh that's why i think i'm hon honing in on this a little bit more than i have in the past as a car in a vacuum when you ignore tesla the ionic 6 rocks i would buy the ionic 5 all day long over this mm. thing though um, not right. not even a question for me that's just my personal opinion some people like sedans somehow this thing won world car design of the year and it's the ugliest thing ever from the back <laughs> i don't know how that's possible um you know I, I were the journalists blind who did that i don't know but anyway some people love the way it looks. Apparently, some people in the comments love the software. I think you're insane if you do. Sorry to offend you. And um, yeah, there you go. I just think Hyundai has a way to go. They've done so great. They're right on the edge. Right. Yes. That, that, that in production. And zeros in like, line. That in production numbers, you know, like, like. Well, they're working. It sounds like they're working on that. And honestly, now that yeah. the tax credit is gone for these cars, uh, the lots are filling up. Oh yeah, okay. Broke so a Hyundai dealer in Colorado Springs. They had like twenty Ionic fives just sitting there. Okay, so maybe some. Uh, well, at least not marked up then. Maybe. Um, no, you, you. There are. There's a Hyundai dealer here in Greeley, Colorado, that's marking up uh, okay. Ionic fives. Still, they have an inventory. I went to one in Loveland. They're doing discounts on them. Apparently, uh, just a few hundred bucks off, five hundred bucks, something like that, thousand bucks. Okay, and. Um, you know, one thing I have to commend Hyundai on, they're doing a really good job of this, is their new app called Evolve Plus. I, we've never talked about it. I don't know if you guys know about this, but um, there's, a, there's a large gap between getting a rental car from Hertz for a month or two, which can get very expensive, right. um, to then leasing a car, which you're locked in for one, two, or three years, typically three years. And, you know, there's a lot of this like middle ground where someone's car just came off lease. They're waiting for their new car to come in. You need, you know, you're here visiting the country for work for a couple months. We don't have like a good subscription service. Hyundai came out with a subscription service and it's not cheap, but it's cheaper than leasing a car and getting out of it. And it's called Evolve Plus. And I believe it's only electric. You can get a Ionic 5 or Kona and you can do them on a... Uh, on a monthly uh, subscription. And I oh. don't uh, don't know too much about it. The mileage limitations are pretty rough, but you know, still I, I found a Kona on there yesterday. I think it was $5.99 a month or something like that, which if you just need a car for a few months, yeah, it's a bad deal overall, but it could be right. interesting to to try to live with an electric car, um, you know, to sample it before you buy. So I have to commend them on at least trying this and getting their dealer partners to work with it. Right. Hmm. Yeah, uh, they do. Yeah. I was just thinking that you threw me off thinking of, of the Evolve thing. I was thinking of, of like a, an app like that, like the Blue Link that they had on the uh, have for Hyundai's that it's actually draining 12 volt batteries, but that's a whole different issue. Um, right. All, all right. So you are, I don't know anything else you want to talk about the uh... to wrap up the Ionic 6. It's a very high quality product that's extremely well engineered that unfortunately is really ugly that you should just buy the Ionic 5. I mean, the Ionic 5 has the utility of the hatchback. And you know, the range think... difference isn't like going to be the make or break unless you'd like, 
I, I really don't know. I got to run them side by side and I will soon. But to me, the Ionic 5, like I'll give up 30 miles of driving or whatever it is to then have all that extra utility and the much better looks and all of that coolness of the Ionic 5. Right on. Oh, I should mention this is on the uh, out of spec guide channel, which, you know, you've mentioned it before, but I hadn't for whatever reason looked at it. And there's like a ton of content up there. Max has, has been working really hard to put stuff together. And it's a, you know, it's a pretty great channel, actually. Yeah, thank you. And Alyssa is now producing content for out of spec guide. So you'll see her on there doing explainers and Colton and me. And, you know, we're all, you know, this is all about the ABCs of electric car, the basics, the videos that the viewers of this show can send to their friends to answer questions more or less. Right on. Awesome. So yeah, definitely check that out. So you also uh, posted up videos this week driving the Nissan Aria in platinum trim with the E-Force drivetrain. So we've been waiting to hear about this particular edition for some time in hopes that the all-wheel drive would offer a more compelling experience than the front drive version. So, oh, and you also did an efficiency test with this in a, with this one in a separate video as well. So yeah, tell us about the Aria with E-Force. Uh, Driving-wise, rocks actually one of the best driving electric cars uh, electric suvs out there really, really fun unbelievably right. great suspension unbelievably great drivetrain tuning the noise of the electric motors is good i mean a little nitpicky because they're non-permanent magnet motors they're externally excited uh, electric motors they don't get the big jump off the line so you have to you nail the throttle and it builds up to about 30 or 40 miles an hour and then gives you full power but when this thing is warm and full charged it scoots like and it pulls deep into the triple dig well into the triple digits but then there's a limiter but we don't need to talk about that too much but it, it pulls really well at high speed and um that is where the good story ends with the aria unfortunately Okay. I mean, well, just, how would you like this, just that part of it though, how would you compare it to like the Ionic 6 or the Ionic 5 we were just talking about? Yeah, that, it would be a very interesting comparison to get both on a back road or a, do a little track thing. Not that people are buying these for the performance stuff, but you know, right. the promise of this E-Force drivetrain being fun to drive and, and exciting actually exactly. did come true. And, and it is that when you really push the car hard, you, it's, you know, it's a seven tenths car where like you come out of a corner and you roll into the throttle and it gives the rear motor everything it can before, you know, really pulling in the front. And I, I thought they tuned the drivetrain really well. Um, you know, just the whole way the car gets down the road is, is very high quality feeling very good. I would hate the front wheel drive. I haven't sampled it, but I know that it would not be, you know, nearly as good because the whole fun part of driving this car is utilizing that rear motor and getting that push out of a corner um, and that little bit of rotation. But if you drive it too hard, you will spin inside wheel on the front axle, um, which is similar to like, you know, the Chevy like, bolt. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's got a little bit of front wheel driveness in there, which you can't really fault them much for, but you know, it's, it's like, I wish it had a limited slip diff on the front at least. Right. Um, Oh shoot! I was going to ask something and it just like popped out of my mind, like a balloon. Oh my god! <laughs> okay, um, you want me? I can just run through this car really quick because we're already at forty-two minutes. Yeah, I'll I'll, um, I'll interrupt you when it comes back and, to my and head. everything. Um, everything's on YouTube, so none of these thoughts will be new or exciting to you if you go and check out the videos. Uh, it's sixty-three thousand dollars as tested, so you have to keep that in the back of your head and no right. tax credit. Um, there are. Uh, less expensive versions, which I hope will be more popular and I believe will be more popular. So they, they start at 40,000 ish, 42, 43 and go up to 63. I, I can't recommend the one I drove because that's just too expensive. You can buy a model Y performance for less money than this. And it gets the $7,500 tax credit on top of that. So like, okay, right. let's just, you it's, know, it's, it's not to yeah. always compare everything to Tesla, but like right. you, know, you would be so dumb to buy this over a model Y performance. Um, but the less expensive trims of the Aria might make more sense. I haven't sampled them. Colton has, and he's done build quality ones on the less expensive versions. He says they feel like crap on the inside. This one also kind of felt like crap on the inside. Little plastic materials, switch gear, speaker grills on a $63,000 car just were not fitting. It felt like you took a $25,000 car and then made it very expensive. How was the uh, material on the seats? Because I, I checked one out here in town, like the low, low spec and the material on the seats, I, I, you know, it felt like bad, bad, like, like not, yeah, this not one good. Had really high quality Napa leather on the seat cover. Okay. okay. But then the sides of the seats are the same. So like your switch gear and like that thin plastic on the side bits are all the same. So like 
they put everything they needed to on the spec sheet to kind of justify the cost of the more expensive ones. But all the little stuff that you really notice as you spend time with the vehicle did not get updated. And, um, you know, I think that's a bit of a shame. So you, you got to go lower spec than this. There's no question. Uh, in terms of the driving dynamics, like I mentioned, that is the true highlight here and should be commended. And Nissan uh, drivetrain and chassis engineers nailed it with this car, I think. To, I to think get that, really good job. To get that driving feel, though, that, that dynamic feel, do you have to have it in sport mode? Because I believe that's what you, you said puts it in, in rear, more rear bias. Uh, yeah. So, so like from a suspension standpoint, it's a fixed suspension so like off throttle handling is the same no matter what you do and that's like it's soft when you really lean it over you're like oh okay right. <laughs> living room couch but it's not meant to be a racer uh to get the drivetrain to really perform the way you want yeah you drive it in sport mode but to be totally honest i kept it in standard 99 percent of the time because i'm just driving around here in my town and running little errands and you know, only when I see like a couple corners, I'm like sport mode on, you know, I knew the steering wheel commands to turn off traction control all the way. You go right, 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 select, select, and then you're off. And then you can just like huck it through corners and get some angles. And it was pretty good at it. Um, but then everything else, not so great. So I think I want to talk about the efficiency and the range first. Right. Yeah. Let's, let's, talk, let's talk about that. Your, your video was called Thirsty Machine. Yeah. It's not, not quite e-tron thirsty, but it's also not that far off. Um, 2.9 miles per kilowatt hour at 70 miles an hour is pretty bad. Um, and then, you know, the range isn't actually terrible. I got 240 miles out of it, um, which, you know, okay. Until you realize it's got a 10 kilowatt hour, more usable capacity than an ID four or an Ionic five. And yeah, you're that's like, not great. okay, not that great. It has a 0.33 coefficient of drag, which um, the Model Y has a 0.23 coefficient of drag. Um, and again, that's time surface area, so it, you can't directly compare those. Right, right, this right. Goes still... to the shape of the Aria really isn't optimized for EV. I do have to say, though, the thing looks great. I, I've kind of been against the Aria looks over the years, but then right. living with it this past week, I come out to that and I had it parked next to Colton's ID4 when we were on a, on a shoot and we came out and um, I was like, wow, that looks so much better than the ID4. So much better, so much more modern, so much you know cooler. And there's three different grades of paint. There's like premium paint, premium plus paint, and then like premium plus plus. I don't like their, their options make no sense for this car for the U S right. market, but this one had like the nicest paint, which you can't even order from the factory. Apparently you can't get a red platinum plus in the U S this was okay. a red platinum plus. I don't know how that happened. Um, but, but, uh, the, the, the main problem I think with the Aria is going to be the, the value of the price. Um, they have like nine different trim levels that you can get, none of which make any sense to me at all. I don't know which one gets what. They're all named like equally unimpressive names. So like you're not sure if the Evolve is better than the Empower. I'm like, which is be like, <laughs> those are just two words. Right. <laughs> it's not like level one, level two or level three or, or Porsche does Turbo and then Turbo S. Like obviously, you know, which one's better. You don't know with the Aria. Um, and and then, you know, the, the range wasn't great. 240 miles. Uh, the the charging is surprisingly not terrible on the okay. initial charge. 130 kilowatt peak. So I'll have a video up maybe tomorrow or the next day about this. But from zero to 6%, it sits at 85 kilowatts. From six to 48%, it sits at 130. Okay. From there, it starts to taper. But it's a very nice taper. And actually, you know what I can do? Uh, I was going to say I could share the screen, but I don't, I don't think I can actually. I'll have a video on this too. The, the charging curve up top really, it, it lets you get a good mid-range and a good top charge. I mean, at 80%, 80, 80 it's still doing 80 kilowatts, uh, 78 kilowatts, somewhere around there. So that's not bad. That's on the first charge. And then you charge it again and again, and it actually artificially limits its fast charging rate after a period of time. And uh, we saw this in Bjorn Nyland's uh, 90 or a uh, thousand kilometer challenge right. where it was just capped at 90 kilowatts. And um, that was weird. Uh, I only got it to get down to about 115, but I didn't take the car on a road trip or do anything. It's possible the U.S. spec cars are tuned differently, uh, but I'd like to play around with that more when I spend more time in an Aria. The, the last point I just want to mention is if you have an Aria, there's two settings you have to be aware of. 
for the EV stuff. And they're in separate screens and separate menus, not related to each other. One has to do with battery cooling. The other has to do with battery heating. You would think they'd be right next to each other, but they're not because software sucks in this car. And uh, in order for battery cooling, you have to manually turn this on. And it seems like the car remembers it half the time and forgets it half the time. And that allows the cooling fans to run at a charging station at full speed. And that means you don't early taper when the battery gets hot. Why that's an option uh, in our market, I have no idea. It has right. to do with Japanese noise regulations, I believe, oh. where you can't have big fans going. But this is America. We don't care about noise. We want fast charging. You know, just let that thing rip. Um, and then the battery heating is kind of cool. It does like some kind of manual preconditioning. And I did notice with the car, no matter, um, you know, sort of the temperature range that I was in, it was it was very sensitive to temperature and it kind of just did its charging curve no matter what, which was great. Okay. And even though it doesn't have a peak charging speed, Model Y is exactly double, by the way, 260 kilowatts on Model Y peak charging speeds than this at 130. And by the way, that's a less expensive car, even fully optioned. I just have to mention that. Uh, maybe yeah. not with FSD, but without FSD, sorry. Well, and, no one should pay for FSD anyway. So Right, I agree. And um, But the thing is, it's only an hour zero to full in the Aria, just because it, it has this nice, well-rounded curve. Right. So while it's not good for road tripping for the 10, 15-minute zap pop-ups and hop to the next station, it is good if you're an Uber driver, if you don't have home charging, for example, where you do need to do high, you know, high state of charge charges on a DC charger, it's really actually not bad at that. So the no big peaks, but the curves uh, livable for those use cases, unacceptable for road trips. Right on. Yeah, Tom, that sounds, a... Kyle, that sounds um, zero to hundred percent in, in an hour. Um, you know, it's, you said 87 kilowatt hour usable. So, I mean, you know, you're averaging almost 90 kilowatt the entire time you're charging. That's pretty good. You know, even, you know, a lot of people, we know we say this all the time, focus on peak charging rates. The charging curve is more important. You know, like mm -hmm. you could get a car that can take in 220 kilowatts and it won't average 90 or 87 kilowatts over the entire charging period. So it's real interesting. But then again, you know, if you want to get to the nitty gritty, then you talk about, well, how good is it doing that short burst, you know, which a lot of people are going to use on road trips. So there's, there's no one way to look at uh, DC fast charging and say, this is how it should charge, you know, and, and for different use cases, it's better to have different types of algorithms that accept power. But um, I'm, I'm you know, I'm impressed that you can fully charge that thing in an hour. I wouldn't have thought that. It, yeah, you, get to 90, of, you get to yeah. 99, the, yeah, the 99 to 100 takes another almost who hour. cares about 99 to 100, you yeah. know, the, yeah, you get exactly. to 99%, you're fully charged, you yes. know, so, you know, um, but that's good. That's good to hear. Um, really good. And exactly. I just want to mention one thing. We had a comment here when you were talking about how the, um, the charging, uh, I mean, the nomenclature for the trim levels doesn't make any sense. Right. Um, who, who I'm, I want to find this comment. Somebody made a comment on about, oh, yeah, Scott said, well, the BMW i3 has the same problems, mega, tera, giga. No, it doesn't, Scott. That makes all the sense in the world. Yes. You've got <laughs> megabyte, gigabyte, and then terabyte. Like, you know which is is lower trim and the higher trim. So I got to uh, stick up for my uh, i3. <laughs> yes. Uh, I actually just drove uh, yesterday. Was it yesterday? Two days ago, an i3 first gen, 2014. Oh, nice. And just, just as a little refresher, Colton was looking at one. He didn't end up buying it, but we, we took it on a little test drive. And I was just like, this is the best thing on the planet. Um, just just love them so much. That's a 10-year-old car. And it's they, they are so – Um, it was it was the future when they made it. And I think they're still pretty much cool to drive. There's Every parts time of I drive, car yeah. that are better than iX and i4 still. <laughs> wow. Every – Every time I drive behind one on the highway, I love the silhouette in the back. Same, and too. every time I drive with the with the glass that kind of mimics yeah. like a smartphone, the, the rear glass hatch, every time I drive behind one, I still look at it and say, that looks futuristic. And we're 10 years in, you know? So, um, you know, I, I know that it got a lot of hate for how it looks, the, the i3, when it first came out. Everybody yeah. said, that's not a BMW. That thing's, you know, terribly ugly and everything. But... I tell you that as as you said that they were ahead of their time, um, and I I I think BMW did a fantastic job designing wise on that for what one small compact car could have had a bigger battery. Uh, you know, even from the get go, it should have had a slightly bigger battery. 
But um, hey, it is what it was, and you know we know the history on the i three. I still love them. So uh, we just put up to our first hour, but, uh, but Kyle, you had a sit down this week with Tomi Ristamaki, the CEO of Campower, a, a company from Finland that produces DC fast charging equipment, which is also going to build a, a new factory in Durham, North Carolina. So this is a company a lot of people are excited about because, among other reasons, their equipment seems to be particularly robust. You spoke to him early. Um, you spoke to him this time about reliability of charging units, but you had him on the Out of Spec podcast previously as well for a more general discussion. Uh, so maybe just uh, not a whole lot of time, but uh, maybe tell us a little bit about Kempower and what you think its involvement in North America will bring in the way of better fast charging experiences. Well, you know, it's it's really hard to say because it's uh, you know proof is in the pudding. We need to right. see these units installed in our market with our power grid situations with our frequencies and and to see how they hold up. But you know, I will say I've used Kempower a ton in Europe. And they're extremely popular in the Scandinavian countries. And that's where I've spent a lot of time, thankfully, in Europe. So I've used, you know, I don't know how many tens or hundreds of charging stations with ChemPower, but I'm very familiar with the units. So I like them quite a bit. It seems right now is the time where everything's coming into the U.S. Alpitronics about to launch in the U.S. ChemPower is coming here. Those are the two that I said we needed in order to have reliable DC fast charging equipment. And guess what? This is the year. It's really 2024 will be the big year of installs, but like there's light at the end of the tunnel here for charger reliability. And at least with ChemPower, they already have working sites, two or three different sites installed in North America online. Uh, there's one in Minnesota that's the closest to me. I may actually just run up there and film it and try it out and see how it's all going because it really is cool. Tomi, typically for our viewers know, I don't, and you guys know this, I don't really like talking to CEOs that often. I like to talk to the nerdy engineers about, you know, very in-depth topics. Mm -hmm. uh, but Tomi is pretty much an engineer, even though he's the CEO. He knew right. every little detail about his entire product and was like, Look, Kyle, we watch all the videos. We know what's going on in America. We know the problems that you guys are having. And he's not like saying we're going to be the best. He's like, we we got to put them in. We got to try them out. We're going to make sure these are good to go. But keep in mind, he's saying that with like the highest reliability chargers in all of Europe. Right. So, you know, we I think this is pretty promising here. The podcast is on the Out of Spec podcast channel, um, which we're starting to do more with again, finally. And, uh, yep, there we go. That's uh Oh, someone said we go to Texas Roadhouse in Minnesota. Hell yeah. Um, maybe we should do an out-of-spec meetup at the uh, Texas Roadhouse in Minnesota. That's Not right. sure where in Minnesota we'll go, but yeah. We had a viewer, Marty Walsh, I think is up there too. He's oh, also a ChemPower cool. fan. He would love to you know, meet y'all up there, I'm sure. Yeah, well, maybe we'll do a little meetup at the ChemPower station for the Minnesota folks. That'd be kind of fun. <laughs> yeah, the, the meetup. Um the last thing I think I just wanted to touch on really quick was my Model S got a round steering wheel. Oh, right, right, right. And Tesla um, came out to my house and swapped it. And it was, I think, the first one in the country is what they were kind of telling me. Okay. And it's so much better now. It's I loved so your, much better. I loved your react. You couldn't hide your natural reaction of this is great. Like without wanting to, you in your video, you were very respectful of, look, like I said about, you know, oh, I come back to the grated cheese, my friend. But if you if you want a substandard steering wheel, you fill your boots. Like if you love your yoke, that's great. And we don't need to fight about anything. But it was so funny watching the smile on your face as you you filmed your first drive with it. And I thought it was so nice because you were like, yes, this is great. <laughs> and I was interested because it's a different wheel. It's a very different wheel to the Model 3, right? So it's actually it's different design and it suits the car. It's bigger. Yeah, it's not as great in a performance setting as the Model 3 wheel. Model 3 wheel is small. You can work it really quick. This is a not necessarily like EQS big, but it's somewhere in the middle. But Tesla got it right. It's still thin enough. The material doesn't feel that great. I took it for the first drive. I went on a three-hour drive with it yesterday. I went up into the mountains, did a loop, and came back down and drove it hard. And you know, just having the confidence of that round wheel, um, having track mode to dial in that car, the mountain pass brakes to really slow that thing down, and 295 section tire square like that model s for being a 12 year old 13 year old chassis however old it is now um or 10 year old i guess 13, 11 mm. i don't know it's old it it's ripped old. i was just like nice. holy smokes this is just demolishing everything and of course the power the plaid powertrain is just like 
insane. insane. You have to recalibrate your brain. Like I was driving the new BMW M2 this week and I'm like, wow, this thing goes pretty good. Like it's fast. And then I get in the plaid and I'm like, whoa, got to recalibrate, <laughs> out, rewire the brain. You got to oh way early. <laughs> it's, it's kind of amazing that the, like the Model S plaids isn't like a huge seller in like in that segment. Like, cause they used to sell like 50,000 of those a year. Right. And now it's like maybe 25,000. The S and X together. It's like the numbers are really way down. I just saw something that said Tycon is outselling Model S. Yeah, no, I would not be surprised. Yeah, it's maybe. Bizarre. I mean, it's an old design, and people like novelty. You know, the human, that's just part of the human nature. We like Well, I also things. just think it's the economy. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I mean, just look at all luxury goods have just... <laughs> yeah. Tell us yeah. about the... They let you have the wheel, but not all of it. Or the yoke, but not oh. all of it. Well, yeah, and so... Um, we had a great mobile technician come out, Jasmine. She was awesome. Rolled up in a P100D Model oh, X, by the way. Just nice. like, imagine getting to service in two seconds. Just like, <laughs> <laughs> insane. And it was on snow tires. And where she covers the distance was really interesting. I was talking to her. She does like Wyoming and North or and um, Nebraska and like goes where there's no charging infrastructure. So she's like, sometimes I got to call a client and say, yeah, I'll come and fix your car, but can I use your level two charger wow. while I'm there so that I can get back to charging network? And right. I was talking to her and they just uh, got her approved for the CCS retrofit on her Model X. Um, so she'll at least have access to use some of this new um, infrastructure that's going into rural areas. So that'll be interesting uh, to see how she handles it. And um, yeah, she left me with the yoke. Uh, but then took the the airbag. I didn't ask for the airbag. Um, maybe she would have left it with me if she if I uh, asked her for it. But um, at least I still have the original yoke. She said they didn't ask for anything back. Okay, hey, I, I, I understand that because that's an explosive, right? So Which I, I thought it. would be really fun to explode. What? Like, <laughs> <laughs> like put it under the seat of the Nissan Leaf and see if it can eject those seat through the roof. <laughs> Uh, Kyle. Yes. All right. Um, okay. So let's let's move along. Um, so this week, uh, with my model, uh, with my Tesla Model uh, Three updated to FSD Beta eleven point three point three, I ran through my testing. You got loop. it. Yes, I did. Oh yeah. Whoa! I still point... haven't. I've been waiting. Oh really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Eleven point three point three. Well, don't get your congrats because it's not really transformative. So this this version takes the two different software stacks and you know kind of brings them together so one unified con you know uh, software stack I guess so that's supposed to improve uh, on highway driving and so I haven't done a lot of ho on highway driving with it yet but that's that's coming so I drove through my loop with my sister in the passenger seat this uh, this week and uh, so it's that's up on my drive electric with Dominic YouTube channel so go check that out please uh, but basically while there are some definite improvements it still like falls on its face occasionally so, for instance, the police had a street blocked off, and after uh, after it changed lanes to go around the police cruiser, but then the, the road is still blocked off. There's like pylons and a Chevy Bolt EV, like the city's car, you know, was still blocking the road, and it wanted to, you know, go between them, <laughs> like, like, <laughs> no. So I had to disengage and you know go around. And there was another spot where, uh, see, it refused to drive through this spot there was a car kind of partially blocking the lane. It was like in the left-hand turn lane, but the, the tail end of it was sticking in my lane. And I could, you know, you could drive through, there was plenty of room, but it did not want to do it. And so I, it's like came to a stop and I had people behind me. So I touched the accelerator and it was going to run right into the car. I had to t and disengage the steer around the corner of the back corner of this car. It was, it was, I don't know. I swear it was going to hit it. If you looked at the video, I, you know, it's really at the last moment that I, I jerked the wheel. So it doesn't because, you know, I'm in you when you're driving an FSD beta, you're still responsible, you're still in control. Yeah, it still like stops like in front of traffic circles or roundabouts. It's like I had to put the accelerator on like here on the video we're watching to get it to go into the traffic circle. And I still really need to figure out this routing situation because I should have went straight there instead of this exit. Because I put in my 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 dude loop, my drive electric with Dominic loop. And I started with the first destination and then I keep adding stops. But then when I go to try to do the loop, it goes to the last stop. So I don't know if I need to do the whole thing in reverse. If, if Maybe there's no way to do it. I don't know. Anyway, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on, on that too much. But uh, congratulations on hitting 2,000 subscribers. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah. So I, I, I think it's uh, still more safer and more enjoyable to drive myself and still not worth $15,000. $15, 15000 
crazy Sorry. if you buy this. I, I it's right. you're the, the, the you're paying them fifteen thousand dollars to beta test to 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 help them improve their product. And hey, if you want to do that, if you want to be a, a beta tester instead of getting paid, pay them to do it. If you think it's fun and it's cool, go, go right ahead. But it's unusable. Like I would never buy this, never in, in, in until it's ready to be used. Until right. you can, I can get in the car, hit a destination, and then kind of like do do some work every now and then, glance up, you know, and grab things. But there's oh, yeah. so many you can't drive you know, a, a few minutes without having to take over. Now, I'm sure there's some roads where it can just do its own thing and, and function, but you can't worry about that. And as far as I'm concerned, if you have to constantly be watching, then it, there's no use in, in e even having it other than to make fun videos and, 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 and get a kick out of it and have some fun, which could be worth it, you know, to, if you enjoy doing that. But right. as a functional product to, to assist your driving, it's useless. And I like... No way would I buy this. Anyway, I, that's my two cents. Right, and I don't, I don't disagree. I, I think I mentioned to my sister in this video that they should pay us to to be, you know, testing their software and, and improving it. But uh, so I didn't want to spend a whole lot of time on my stuff. I got some interesting stuff I want to shoot this weekend too. I, I got to playing with the, uh, with the uh, the music maker inside the car. Uh, what you call it? Anyway. It's something coming up anyway. I'll, I'll have a new. You're gonna produce a song. You you should release a song. By the way, for those of you who don't know, Dominic's in a band. You should release a song that is just created on Tesla's uh, music maker. Yes, it'll be in my next video. I'm gonna use it to fill a space. And so okay. you know, I've like I I've got, so I've took the license plate cover off the front of my car, the license plate on the front of my car, and uh, there's some like there's like long stretches of me with a fishing wire, just like try struggling yeah. like a whatever and uh so I, yeah i was going to speed up that footage and then play this little bit of music over it but i've only got one so far so and it was something i just made up and then i i, I use that to learn how, how to you know to use this thing because it's there's no instructions right <laughs> this is like right it's not yeah you just got to hit every button and see what it does right it, it takes a while it takes a while so but i'm going to take one of my songs that i've already written and then try to recreate it on, on this software and just you know but, That's and I'll, cool. and I'll video that so people can see, learn how to, you know, actually work this stuff. Cause it's not that intuitive, you know, well, a lot of it is need but, a musician to teach us. It's more, yeah, it's just be able, yeah, touching all the things and see what happens. Yeah. But, and I probably do with that, do that with Kay, my, my bass player. She helped me with this new song. She put like the bass line. Oh, and it all came together. So it, I think anyway, it's like, you can't do so much with it. You put so much information in there. It starts crashing. Oh, really? You can save, save often. <laughs> yeah. But, but anyway, uh, she's great. Kay is really good. Yeah. All right. But, uh, so I wanted to get in news, but we had a bit of news yesterday that I wanted to bring up real quick that, uh, Walmart is going to add thousands of EV charging stations to stores by 2020 by 2030. So this date is still a little ways out there, but I thought it was, you know, significant. Uh, Cause so they have, they have uh, Walmart has a lot of electrify America locations in about 280 of their stores, but they have 4,600 stores more than that in the U S uh, that's a lot of stores. And, uh, I think it could be transformative depending on the speed at which they can put the infrastructure in because a lot of people, you know, if they go to Walmart at least once a week, that could be their charging stop easily. I mean, for people who just, you know, do their, you know, 30, 40 mile commute, whatever, uh, they don't have a garage, maybe they have to street park, but they go to Walmart once a week or more. And so that while they're there doing the shopping, it's like an hour, you're going to be in Walmart an hour. You're doing all your grocery shopping, maybe a few other things. I think that, you know, it could really be like transformative and a really nice uh, chunk of the, uh, so, you know, the, the charging infrastructure puzzle. This could really solve it for a lot of people. I don't know if anyone wanted to mention any or anything. So is is this that. like your main supermarket in the US where you, you, you know, that's the sort of the mainstream where families go to get their, their weekly shopping? In a lot of places, yeah. They, I mean, they now have a lot, you know, there's most of them or a lot of them have grocery stores inside them besides oh, okay. being a, a general so Martin, good store. It's a bit like uh, they have literally everything you can think of packed in a building, yeah. but then only some of them have the grocery store component. It's right. not typically where people shop for their food needs. 
It's like, I want to get some clothing. I want to get some car supplies. I want to get a new TV. Uh, you know, it's yeah. just, you know, whatever, I don't know. People go to Walmart to buy literally everything. And right. um, yeah. I've never but found that equivalent more... that we have over here. So here we have the big supermarket chains. Um, Tesco would be a famous one. You know, in front, uh, Marks and Spencer's? No, not so. I'm talking about the big grocery shops. That just, okay. It's just huge, full of food. And in, you know, in, in France and, and places like Carrefour, um, where it's just, you know, just wine and cheese and <laughs> <laughs> food. Every... And I, whenever I've been to the US, I've never managed to find an equivalent i've always find either just like smaller smaller grocery stores I'm like, where, where like d does america have these massive food oh, oh we do yeah oh yeah huge i wonder if that was what walmart was but okay so more yeah, we have more, like like in this yeah they didn't used yeah, to have, have like, food martin but now more and more yeah. walmarts have like supermarkets and more and more people are starting to use walmart as their supermarket it's a giant mega store uh, it has, yeah. as Kyle said, everything. You could buy clothing, footwear, your TV, uh, yeah. a fishing rod, <laughs> tires for your car, everything Walmart has. And, um, you know, Big the thing TVs. is they have a tremendous amount of locations yeah. and they have huge parking lots. They could yeah. easily put giant uh, facilities for charging if they wanted to. Now, um, it, it, here in the U.S., we have Costco, which is also a, a huge, like, kind of warehouse shopping. And they have they have gas. They added gasoline stations at many of the Costco locations. And they sell gas really cheap. And it's, like, the most, it, it, the busiest type of gas station. Anywhere you go, there's lines to get to Costco. They're trying to limit you. You can only get it if you have a Costco um, uh, account. So that way they can, they, they're not getting uh, their lines all clogged up by people that don't shop at Costco. I wonder if Walmart could do something like that and do like the Walmart charging network. And in order to use it, you need to be a Walmart super shopper or whatever and have like a Walmart card. So that how that's how you get access. And then they sell it for 10 cents a kilowatt hour, less than what the other networks are selling it for because they know they have a captured customer on the lot for a, a good period of time. And a lot of times the people are going to walk in and, and spend 30, 40, 50, $100 in Walmart. I wonder if there's a business model for that, you know, and, um, you know, it's, it's, it's worth looking into. They have the real estate, they have the parking, you know, they, they, they so, you know, it might be something worth, uh, worth, worth considering if you're Walmart. And would that be DC fast charges in, in, in your head? Yeah, so, absolutely. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm okay. thinking we might not have to go to th that many 350s. You could have like a lot of lower because if people are in there for an hour, they don't need 350 kilowatt stations. Yeah, right? that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Like, you know, would, is it better to have eight charges or 80 charges at those kind right. of massive More. 20, 20, 150 kilowatt chargers, a whole row of them? Yeah, it, really kilowatt have is, yeah. It, it just needs site level power distribution. So, like a Kim Power Solution or Tesla supercharger, put as much DC hardware charging power that the grid connection will allow, and then as many satellite dispensers as you can, and let it load manage. Yeah, it, it would be true. nice, you know. With but so since Walmart has like the the resources, like no one else does, it would be really nice to see them put like solar canopies over their their parking lots as well. Just mm. I'm just saying, throwing that out there. <laughs> they, yeah, like do, yeah. they do in the desert. Oh, really? Like, yeah, okay. in hot climates, for example, there's one um, near Mojave somewhere out there that they have solar canopies throughout the Walmart parking lot. Wow, that'd be so nice. That'd be nice in Florida, I know, because, because so, I mean, sometimes you have to park far from the building and it gets like 90, 100 degrees here, no problem. It's, uh, it's nice to have a canopy. And, and Walmart could do this. You look at their balance sheet, you know, that yeah, the, exactly. this yeah. wouldn't, like, they could invest a billion dollars in installing or $2 billion mm. installing, you know, chargers in all their locations. And it would just be like, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's nothing for Walmart. Yeah. A little, so, a little bit wow. of battery, a little bit of battery storage and they could, you know, from up to the, like the yeah. grid and, and their whole areas, you know, that could be a whole, it's a whole and whatever it's a sustainable energy situation going on centered on mm. all these stores. Well, the thing I, when, when Walmart I, is the mm. cost. They're going to try and find the cheapest hardware and sell it at the cheapest electricity rates. <laughs> and, you know, it might work really well. So we'll see. Yeah, yeah. We'll, okay. see. we'll see. Was, you know, the interesting good. thing is the dwell time will increase on their property with their customers that DC fast charge. And there's proven 
you know, this has been proven. If somebody's in your store for a longer period of time, they spend more money. Yeah, you know, I did a, a a study on this, if you want to call it a study. But when I had my chargers, they were level two charger at, at my restaurant years ago. I used to pay attention and write down when customers would come in and plug in. Um, I had my my managers always tell me if the, whenever they saw someone plug in, come in, we'd write the time they came to sit down to eat and then would write the time they left. And I noticed when people were charging on the in the charger of my parking lot, they tended to stay 30 minutes longer than the average dwell time for a customer that just came in to eat. And that's a big, it, uh, 30 minutes is a lot more. When the average customer was staying 30 to 40 minutes at my restaurant, now they were staying an hour, hour and 15 minutes. Um, it, it made a difference. And um, they would, instead of just uh, eating and leaving, they would then have a cup of coffee and a, and a cake, you know, which was all sheer profit. Restaurants want you to buy dessert because it's 100% profit for them. They've already made their money on the, on, on, on the food or they'd right. order a salad uh, before because they knew they were, they, they knew I, I need to be here for an hour to get to where I'm going. So, you know, it, it, there, there's, there's proven. And uh, like I said, mine was not really a comprehensive study, but there's comprehensive studies out there that, um, that prove when you're there longer, you spend more money. And it's why interesting thing. I read a whole study on this years ago. It's why supermarket music is very slow. Like, <laughs> like it's, it's not upbeat music because right. They studied you walk faster down right. the aisle when the music is an upbeat beat. When it's a slow, like elevator music, you kind of just mosey on <laughs> down the lane. And just by spending an extra 10 minutes in a supermarket, you spend on average $10 more or something like that. There's a whole study done. So Walmart could use that and say, look, we've got a captured customer. They're plugged in. And hey, we'll make money on the on the on the on the purchases, even if we give them the electricity at cost. So that could, could that was my question something. about the speed of charging, because yeah. if you're charging yeah. too fast, right. maybe it's because I'm more conscientious than some EV drivers. But I know that if my car is 80 percent, I get a little bit stressed that I want to go and move my car. Um, or if I, if the queue is, oh, I've ended up just browsing for longer and I'm charging my car and it's, and I've, and, oh, I want to go move it or like, we should get going now. So that's, I, there is probably going to be a sweet spot on the charging speed as well. That's right. not too fast, not too slow, because mm. if the car is full in 18 minutes, you're like, I gotta go, I, I gotta move, especially if there's a, um, an overstay fee or, uh, anything like that. So yeah, they'll, they'll work all this out. Um, that's really interesting to think about. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to bring that up because I just I just think it's like a potentially a huge, you know, big deal. But I mean, we like Kyle says, we, we have to see what actually happens on the ground in reality because sometimes you know the dream doesn't often live up to you know expectations in in the reality. But whatever. Yeah. Let's talk about a couple uh, news items real quick. The Ram fifteen hundred Rev electric pickup truck made its official debut in a Super Bowl ad. But we didn't get to get any spec. We didn't get to see any specs until like this week. So I don't know what you all expected, but I didn't quite expect this. I mean, they say good things come to those who wait, and at least on paper, this thing looks pretty great. So let's talk about batteries for a moment. Uh, Ram Rev is going to have two different battery options: a 100, 168 kilowatt hour pack. The estimate is good for 350 miles of range, and a 229 kilowatt hour pack. They claim can go 500 miles on a charge. So contrary to what I expected, at least for now, there was no mention of a range extender for a plug-in hybrid version. So it's a it's an 800 volt architecture, and they say peak charging power is 350 kilowatts. It also features bi-directional charging, so you can power as much as like 7.2 kilowatts worth of electric stuff off board, off the back. I think the front, the front has a, a 3.5 or something kilowatt hour outlet, you know, worth of power up there. Uh, it's got 250 kilowatt motors on each axle, so it puts out 654 horsepower, 620 pound feet of torque, and they say it can hit 60 from zero in 4.4 4 .4 seconds. So it can also tow up to 14,000 pounds and it has a 27,000 or 2,700 pound payload. So a couple of other things I think are worth mentioning real quick. It has an active leveling air suspension with adaptive dampers and multi-link rear suspension, which is great. So the handling and ride should be pretty great. Uh, it also has a huge frunk 
with 15 cubic feet of storage space. So Tom, have you ever reserved one of these? Is it, it sounds like yes. it'll give it, it sounds like it'll give you one F-150 Lightning a little bit of a run for its money. So I have, and I don't even I don't even think it's reserved. I don't know what I've done. Okay. I, all I know is I gave them money, and I'm in a club like the Ram Club. It's okay. it's it's weird. Like you don't have a reservation. You're just invited to be like one of the people that at some point will be able to reserve one uh, later on the road. So l later down the road. And um, it's it's kind of weird what 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 uh, Dodge did with this. But in any event, looks really cool. Uh, I, I checked it out at the uh, auto show yesterday. Um, okay. You know, really cool. It's interesting that styling wise, like we saw that concept and it looked so futuristic and so sleek. But now when you see what they're doing here, it kind of, it's very pedestrian. You know, it, the exterior styling, at least, it, it, it almost looks like it could be a truck that came out three years ago. You know, the, the front grill has some some interesting with the headlights and everything. But when you do a walk around, it's interesting how Ford and Dodge both went with like, OK, we just want these to look like normal trucks. Nothing out of the ordinary. But GM went in a different direction with the Silverado. It's kind of like a futuristic, funky kind of styling, you know, so um, it's interesting how that how that worked out. I was expecting dodge to do something a little bit more wild based on their concept you know but uh this is what we're getting interior look really cool specs are pretty interesting 229 kill kilowatt hour battery pack it's huge i but, mean it's like the silverado ev has got the big battery like that too right yeah yeah it's 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 an enormous battery pack um you know it's it's going to be interesting and uh it's going to have some good specs for towing if you get the 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 bigger battery pack you know, you'd probably be able to tow further with it, but you're still going to have that same issue. If we don't improve our infrastructure for DC fast charging, you're still, yeah. you know, pulling into a DC fast charger with a trailer. Yeah. You'll be able to go an extra 40 or 50 miles in this th than you would say with a lightning or maybe 70 miles more. But it, you know, if you're going hundreds of miles, you still need pull through charging stations that are really basically non-existent at this point in order to make it work. So, yeah. um, you know, it's 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 an evolution it's it's that much better than the lightning in in some regards but it's coming out a few years later it should be better it should do things better it should go further uh you know and uh, it's going to be interesting how the the whole truck scene plays out over the next couple of years i, I like the, it seems like outdo like the, so it's one cubic foot bigger i think than the, the, the front and the front is one foot cubic foot bigger than the ford f-150 lightning yeah, the, uh, the zero to sixty is like point, you know, point of a second quicker than the uh, Chevy Silverado EV, like four point five seconds to sixty. This was, but it's not as quick as the Lightning. The Lightning's quicker. Is it really? What's the Lightning? Yeah, Lightning's pretty much four seconds flat. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay, because it didn't have a huge 200, 200 kilowatt hour battery to pack to hang around. Yeah. Also, the the range is a little bit suspect to me. I don't know. So they said five hundred miles on this two hundred. What was it? Thirty five kilowatt hour pack. Uh, uh, but the uh, Silverado BV is like 400 with, you know, probably 200. I mean, I don't know if it's like 200 kilowatt hour, uh, 200 kilowatt hour pack. I don't know if that's not sure if, if that's uh, usable or what. So I don't know. It seems like the 100, 100 miles is a, like a big delta, you know, but maybe. Or roughly the same size packs, you know, yeah. maybe. You know, it, it does seem uh, interesting. Well, who knows? You know, maybe GM is, uh, you know, uh, under promising, you know, and when the, the Silverado EV gets EPA range rated, now all of a sudden it's 430, you know, and uh, the the Dodge comes out at 480 because of whatever they did. Maybe the battery's a little bit bigger. Or maybe they're letting you use more of the capacity. I don't know. Um, so, you know, it's it's it does seem, I, I can't imagine it being 100 miles more than the Silverado you know, unless the battery ends up being a lot bigger. But it, you know, it does seem like they have a contender here. Like they've got pretty much everything they need. What do you think, Kyle? Sorry, I had to find the unmute button. Uh, Sorry. I actually think like this could, so first of all, the, the okay. The Hummer EV had a massive battery pack like this, and I thought right. it was really funny. And like, this is like hilarious because it's very excessive and it's, you know, USA being USA, like this comment said. And I was like, you know what? For such a low production Hummer EV halo car, like that's cool. I'm all about that. You know, let's go big bad and do some crazy things. Uh, 
now we're starting to get into some higher volume trucks here. And these are having huge battery packs. Um, there, that That's like, to me, what would be more useful is to put a 75 kilowatt hour battery pack in this and then a little generator in the back, like an I3 range extender thing. And I think, you know, 99% or let's say 90% of this truck's use case would fit into that 75 kilowatt hour, um, you know, usage. And then for the towing stuff, even the 200 kilowatt hour pack is going to suck to tow with. So, you know, that that's when you're going to want the the extended generator anyway. So I'm not a hundred percent sure why you would need such a big battery pack or so much range in these trucks, other than they're just doing too many focus groups and listening to too many people um, who really haven't lived with an electric truck before um, to build these. Now, of course, there's always going to be a use case or, or the, the, you know, the outliers that will use every bit of this pack on a consistent basis. And it's great to have that option. It just seems like a lot of battery in, in an EV, but I think Ram got it right. All the specs look good. 80 amp onboard charger, 350 kilowatt charging. We'll have to look at the curve. You know, Stellantis is not new to building electric cars. They're one of the larger electric vehicle manufacturers, at least in Europe. We don't get any of that here, but right. they know what these things will go through. They understand how these need to be engineered. And, um, yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see. I mean, it's going to be expensive to charge. If they give this thing free charging, oh my gosh, they are going to lose so much money. <laughs> yeah, I don't think they like three don't years know. of free charging. So, know. and to Kyle's point, that that larger battery pack is an option. Right. So it's not like they're saying 229 kilowatt hour. This is what you're getting. Only the people that want that or need that or think they need that are going to pay for it because it will be substantially more expensive than the uh, the smaller pack. And the smaller pack, it's, it's you know, how do you say that's the smaller pack? What is it? 100, 168. 168 kilowatt hour. That's you huge. Know, it's, it's still yeah. bigger than the battery pack of my Lightning. The Lightning's gross capacity, I think, is 145. So, um, you know, it's, it's still bigger than the battery pack of my Lightning. And that battery pack is going to be fine for more than 90% of, of Ram Rev uh owners, you know, uh, uh, so, you know, I, I, I like having optional packs. I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of takers on the, on, on the extended range pack, you know, unless you just have more money than cents and you just decide that you want to just throw money at it. Uh, it, there's a use case, as Kyle said, for a small amount of people, people in the Midwest that want an electric battery, uh, truck, that do do towing, that want to squeeze out every mile they can. And even for them, it's not going to be the perfect a solution because if you do need to try tr drive seven eight hundred miles even with this big battery pack you still are going to have to stop we still don't have proper infrastructure to do pull through charging uh you know who knows maybe that's going to change in the next couple of years but um you know it's it's good that the, the pack's optional that was basically my main point here right uh right on. so we should move right along i don't know if they, they need to say any more about this we need to we need to drive this thing but i'm yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm like I'm, I'm pretty happy to see it though, right? It looks like I'm I'm kind of surprised that they went like this this big, this like you know, bold like tech wise, spec wise. So the other big news this week, I think, is that Tesla has just sort of teased three new vehicles. So it released the written version of its master plan part three, uh, which is a 41 page document that you can find on their site. And it outlines a plan for a global sustainable energy economy. In those pages, they list the various vehicle types that Tesla makes and will make in the near future, except for the Roadster, they don't mention that, uh, along with the battery sizes and chemistry and the hope for production volumes. So we all probably know that the company has a more affordable model planned. In this document, we're told that it will have a 53 kilowatt hour LFP battery, uh, and they hope to make 4 million of them a year, eventually. That's 2 million out of the uh, Mexico Gigafactory that was just announced, and then 2 million uh, split between Berlin and Shanghai somehow. So the, the other new vehicles will be, according to this document, a van in both passenger and commercial flavors, along with a bus. So interestingly, the the volumes for the van are higher than the Model S, Model X, and Cybertruck combined, and it will have a high nickel battery. Uh, the production volumes for the bus seem to be a bit more modest, of course, and it's going to have like an LFP uh, 300 kilowatt hour pack. So Martin, that's a lot of 
uh, small cars and van sales. We don't need a lot of analysis here, but I'd like to hear what, what your thoughts are. I think uh, because this is so far off in the future and, you know, you can play the where's the Cybertruck card sure. if you want, that Tesla can talk about these things all they like. On a really broad perspective, I'd love to know listeners' thoughts in the comments. Make sure you leave your thoughts and, and, and join in the conversation as well about where, you know, if, if people feel that one company, one badge can do everything from selling a $150,000 Model S, Model X got a bit cheaper recently, down to a a compact car, a budget car, a van. Vans are going to get wrecked. They're working vehicles. They're going to be used. I don't, you know, if I see a if I see a, a Fiat Ducato or a, a Renault Master or something that's got dinks and dents all over it and it's delivering some Amazon parcels, do I think, man, I really, really, you know, one day I'll save up and I'll buy a Renault. You know, so so I, what I'm saying is, what I think it's amazing that Tesla are doing this. They're setting out their 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 roadmap. I think that's very cool. The discussion I think will be interesting to have over the next you know a few years, just sort of kick it around. Really, is can te can Tesla do that? You know, can Tesla have everything at all price points? Because Toyota don't, so they know that they've got to have you know a Lexus to go and and sell. And we've had that conversation on the podcast today about sixty thousand dollar Nissan Aria. And if I say to my you know my wife, who's not into cars. Uh, oh, here's this car. She'd look at that and go, yeah, 25, 30 grand. Go, no, it's 60,000 pounds for a Nissan. And again, if I was like, oh, hey, let's get the new the new Audi or the new you know, Mercedes-Benz EQC and it's this much, she would get that that's that's the trade-off that's going to hold its value. And, and so, yeah, really interesting to see what electrification is. On a broader perspective, what EVs do to the car industry. I think VW have changed their tune a bit recently, talking about, you know, why would we get rid of the Golf name? Because Golf is famous. And so... ID3 is great, but what's wrong with the word golf? And so everyone's exploring this. Tesla will have to explore it as well. Could there even be Tesla vehicles that don't have a Tesla badge on? You know, a little bit like the 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 Amazon vans that Rivian are making. So uh yeah, that's the that's the broad perspective on on where where does that company go in terms of the cars they sell and and then the money, the 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 premium that until now Tesla has commanded that I think already they're starting to lose. I don't I don't see a Tesla anymore and think, wow, you know, which you have five years ago, you think, oh that's cool, right? Right. right. And just just model threes everywhere. Like and, I, and you know if I lived in California it'd be it'd be you know even more. So really interesting that they're setting this out. I think it'll be fascinating to watch how they navigate that at least some marketing decisions yeah. to be had of the company. People in the comments are pointing out that Mercedes kind of does this, though, right? They sell small cars, vans, and and big trucks, right? So, I well, the Mercedes dealership just down the road from me have Mercedes and Smart on one lot, and I get that, um, which I always think is is an interesting thing to do. Uh, the whole Smart thing that Mercedes went down, which okay, that's interesting that uh, they use a different name, and you know, and, and there's different investment in that brand now. But um, yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, the the smaller. You know, do you see that? You see beaten up old Mercedes A class, and you think, ah, oh, that looks that's a wreck. Like that's a terrible thing to have a have a Mercedes badge on. So yeah, it's, right. we don't have the A class that, here. That have doesn't you, really uh, work. Martin, have you seen the new uh, hashtag number one thing? Smart. Yeah. Are they out? i uh, not. I don't think I've not seen one driving around. I'm not sure if they are out or okay. not. But again, it's interesting with that Chinese investment in that because. That that's the whole different thing to come in, you know. Do we uh, do we care what brands stand for anymore? I think we hopefully soon we'll start talking about the uh, well when it comes to Europe and uh, Australia and, and UK. I think they'll they'll call the BYD seal the Atto Four. Now we're talking about the Atto Three at the moment, but again, there's a car that's two thirds of the price of a Tesla. Do people care uh, where that car comes from? Will they pay the Tesla premium? Um, what was that uh, that old cliche years ago? It's what the Tesla stretch. People do the Tesla stretch to get one. I'm not sure that exists anymore, but I'd like to be. I'd like to have that conversation with with people in the comments and let us know what you think. Well, this is uh, really close to home right now because um, two of my colleagues are buying cars this week, and uh, Max is uh, buying an electric car, and Ryan is buying an electric car, and Ryan is going from a Bolt to a Model Three LFP. Nice. And so, you know, just like made the right sensible decision, I thought. And like, you know, that's just the car. And that's great. Max is like, 
uh, everyone has a Tesla. Ryan's getting one. You have them. Like, I just don't like, I know how good they are. I just don't want one. He's like, I, <laughs> you know, we have enough to make videos with. And he's like, I'm going to spend more money and buy a used Polestar too. Oh, really? And so, That's um, nice. like, what a great choice. Right. And so anyway, we found a really nice one. It's got performance pack with the Oleans and all Ooh. the good stuff. So like, that'll be sweet. Um, and so hopefully that all goes through. He hasn't fully committed to it yet, but he, it was really funny talking to him because he's like, you know what? Everyone has Teslas and that to him turned him off from it. He's like, yeah, yeah I know right, the car's right. better, but I just want something different. Sure. Yeah. Some, uh, maybe, uh, yeah, we're all different, right? Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so I think, what do you think? That brings us into the show. I think Yeah, probably I imagine. Right. Yeah. Oh, wait, we didn't talk half. about uh, I, oh. there's one, one big news story. I'm sorry. Oh, you sure, can no. now order a Model Y 4680 directly from the site. Oh, I didn't know where you couldn't before. Oh, no, oh, you, you can, can specify an inventory. So yeah, now you can yeah. order a standard Model Y for under fifty thousand dollars. It's still dual motor, and um, that's and it still gets the seventy five hundred dollar tax credit. So that's a good one to uh, to look at there. Okay, yep. 200 miles of range. That's good. Yeah, I, I still think it's worth it to spec up for the 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 long range version. It's only a few thousand dollars, and you know it's you get true. a little much more range. Yeah, three thousand three thousand dollars and fifty miles. Oh, geez, range. yeah, yeah. Um, three three thirty is pretty comfortable. You know, that's probably what three hundred on the highway, right? Yeah, probably not. Probably less than that. Okay, but um. Yeah. I, anyway, I think I'm going to go rent one of these today. Uh, okay. They have them at just at locally, the Model Y non-long range. And I've never tested one. So I think I'm okay. going to go to Hertz and borrow one and make some do a range test and make some videos with it. Sweet. That sounds like a good idea. I think I'm going to watch out of spec videos this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By the way, stream. Our, first, our first podcast, 45 minutes long. Oh, really? Boy, have we smashed that these days. We've doubled it. Okay. And we used to, and that was, yeah, and that was not live too. That was like pre recorded, and you know, you had to spend time editing. But now, also, so the editing, the, the uh, runtime's longer, but the editing time is like a lot shorter. Yeah, Kyle used to make the intros, that, that fancy intro that it had, and I used to do other bits as well. And I think after two or three shows, we both said, We're not doing this anymore. Let's just do it live. <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> Well, I want to thank everybody, all, all of our watchers, all the years, you know, three years. This has been an amazing run. We've had millions of views and listeners, and uh, it's inspired us to keep doing this. If it kind of, we just kind of started this and said, hey, let's give it a shot. If you remember, it's right when COVID started, right. uh, you know, in, in April of 2020. And we were like, well, let's give it a shot. You know, maybe it'll fizzle. Maybe no, it'll, nobody will be interested. Right. Uh, but it turned out to be a smashing success uh, everywhere I go. You know, people talk about the Inside of East podcast. Oh, I watch you on the podcast, you know, and um, it's 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 been great. And that's what kept us from continuing doing this. And uh, you guys are the best. And you're 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 the reason why we're, we're we get together and do this every week. And, um, you know, as long as you keep watching, we're going to keep doing it. And thanks a lot. Uh, there's one last thing I want to point out before we sign off. I mentioned last week in our. Yeah, th there we go. Jeez. <laughs> I mentioned last week in our uh, in the on the show that I'm going to be selling my Rivian R1T and I have a friend that's that that wants to buy it. He's having a little difficulty selling his Model X for enough money to be able to buy my Rivian R1T. And we had some comments in last week's show saying, Tom, I thought you might offer it to the buyers. So um, I'm selling my Rivian R1T because I'm getting a Rivian R1S. It's got 7,000 miles, forest green, ocean coast interior, great color combo, every option possible. It is, um, if you were to spec the same truck now, it's $97,050. And it doesn't even have the some of the things that I have on mine because they they canceled uh, some of the options. So um, basically, I was going to sell it to my buddy for $15,000 than what it would cost to buy it new now. If anybody's interested, tom.malogany at insideevs.com. And make sure you put in the in the um, the, the section where the the title of your of the email god i can't get that word out um rivian r1t because i get like 50 emails a day and i i honestly i can't even, i don't even respond to many of the emails but then i'll know you're interested in talking to me about that so i'm still planning on selling it to my buddy but i need to sell this now because the r1s is ready rivian wants me to pick it up and if he if it's going to take too long for him to get things going and somebody else is ready to buy it uh we could talk about it so um shoot me an email if you're interested 
Right on. Awesome. Uh, I'm I'm interested, but I'd I'd have to sell my house. <laughs> could live then in I would have to live in the time. truck. <laughs> you could do that. Yeah, I don't think my wife and my cat would be happy with that. <laughs> you, you, if it, it still had the camp kitchen, you live in it. But, exactly. You know, All right, and, and, to be honest kitchen, with you, that would change everything. That's a contributing factor to why I sold. Uh, I'm selling this over the the Lightning. I wanted the camp kitchen. I ordered it with the camp mm. kitchen. If it had right. that, then it would have been. I would have really been thinking about. You know, that would have helped push it closer to uh to to keeping but and now it's like canceled it's not even they've been delayed delay delay i think they're just done like okay we're not doing that and uh that's disappointing because it was such a cool uh feature hey uh i just sorry one more little th thing uh abe mentioned earlier we didn't even go over the id7 actually uh seth Miersma, our editor-in-chief at motor one he was he drove it and he was going to come on this morning and talk about it, but he had a lot of things come up and he couldn't do that. I don't know if anyone, uh, Kyle, you haven't driven the ID seven yet, right? No, but Bjorn has a great video top speed on the Autobahn in it. Watch that. <laughs> nice. That's the one to watch. <laughs> All right. But hopefully yeah, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get it. We'll drive it at some point, you know, probably sooner than later. And we'll, you know, let, let you know what we think. But uh, for now, that brings us to the end of our show. So if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them on the Inside DVs forum podcast thread or on our YouTube or Twitch comment sections. If you like the show, please give us a thumbs up if you're watching us on YouTube. Uh, don't forget you can follow our panelists on Twitter. Follow Tom Malogny at Tom Malog with two M's. Martin Lee is at EV hmm. News Daily. Kyle Connor is at It's Kyle Connor. I'm now verified on post.news at Dominic, my first verified account ever on social media. I'm pretty excited. Uh, so click subscribe, tap that bell icon for notifications. Thank you all for watching these past three years. We really appreciate you. It's great to see all your names, familiar names coming up in the comments every week. Uh, right. We'll see you all next week. Ciao.